Thank you very much, Sabine. Well, um, good morning, good day, and good evening. In my case, it is 8 a.m. in the morning as I'm greeting you from Santiago de Chile. My name is Elina Miriminskaya. I am a Russian lawyer practicing in Latin America. But uh, enough about me. Let me remind you of the topic of our coffee session. Um, who are the judges to judge arbitrability? While we were preparing for this session, we were able to review how different the approaches to arbitrability, to arbitrability, arbitrability, and the answers to this question can be. And to help us to conduct a useful comparison, this panel includes Shelby Grubbs and Sabina Sacco. I will represent, I will present a short bias of both of them. Uh, Shelby Grubbs is off council in the Atlanta, Georgia office of Miller and Martin LLP. He works as an advocate, arbitrator, mediator, and special master. His arbitration experience includes work as a panelist for the American Arbitration Association, CPR Institute, International Center for Dispute Resolution, International Chamber of Commerce, and World Intellectual Property Organization. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a member of the ICC Commission on Arbitration and IDR. Sabina Sacco is partner at Levi Kaufmann Koller. Sabina uh, is seated in Geneva, Switzerland, where she specializes in international commercial and investment arbitration. She has acted as counsel, arbitrator, secretary, or assistant to the tribunal in over 30 international arbitration proceedings under the ICC, ICSID, UNCTRAL, and LCIA rules. She is a member of the IBA task force on the revision of the IBA rules on the taking of evidence and of the ICC task force on maximizing the probative value of witness evidence. She is also a member of the advisory committee of the Madrid Arbitration Court and of the ICC Dispute Resolution Bulletin Edi Editorial Board. Sabina holds a law degree from the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and an LLM from Harvard Law School. She is admitted to the Chilean and New York bars. Before we begin, uh, just one last housekeeping detail. There is a distinction between active and inactive participants. Only inactive participants can um, speak. Um, sorry, only active participants can speak and we've upgraded active users to panelists for them to be visible on the screen so they can raise a hand and join uh, our live discussion. Inactive participants can only chat but we invite you to participate in either way. And now Sabina please walk us through the relevant concepts and definitions so we can be all on the same page. Thank you very much, Alina, for that introduction. Um, we have all gathered here today to discuss arbitrability, who decides what is and what is not arbitrable. Is it judges or is it arbitrators? So before we start, I'm going to, to, to give some, a few definitions that are going to help us through this journey. Um, the first one is, what is arbitrability? As you will see today, this concept um, is different in different jurisdictions, but we will start with a general definition, which is that it implies the status or characteristic of being lawfully susceptible to decision by arbitration. Um, what is jurisdiction? It is the power, right, or authority to decide. When this is conferred to arbitral tribunals in an arbitration, um, this depends on several factors, but the essential one is that the parties must have conferred uh, this authority to the arbitrators through a valid arbitration agreement and with respect to a dispute that is arbitrable. Um, what is an invisible claim? It is a claim that is capable of being submitted for decision. If a tribunal has jurisdiction, as a second step, it must also ascertain whether the claim is admissible. 
As the ICJ has stated, uh, the courts of the tribunal in this case must examine whether, despite having jurisdiction, there exists another legal reason why the claim should not be heard. Uh, and this might be the case when the case is not right, for instance, when there is a cooling off period or when um, there is another procedural precondition or, for instance, in cases of res judicata. And we finally wanted to give two very basic uh, definitions with respect to arbitrator and judge. We will speak of arbitrator instead of tribunal uh, so that we can clearly distinguish in, from a judge. We will also prefer the word judge to court so that we do not, um, we, we try to maintain these two very distinct. Um, so an arbitrator is a person appointed through a process administered by an arbitral institution or by parties to decide a matter in arbitration. And a judge is a public official appointed by a sovereign state to decide matters in accordance with a civil or criminal legal regime. Um, so as I first mentioned, the concept of arbitrability itself varies depending on the jurisdiction. And here I would like to invite Shelby to explain to us what is the US conception of the um, concept of arbitrability. Shelby, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Sabina, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon to those of you who are in uh, the uh, uh, earlier time zones. Uh, as uh, Sabina suggested, uh, there are differences in the way uh, different jurisdictions uh, look at the term arbitrability. Um, uh, but I think uh, that the U.S. is a bit of an outlier, candidly. Uh, I think that for most of the world, the term arbitrability, or, or at least the term objective arbitrability, embraces uh, uh, only what uh, in the U.S. we might just call a legal prohibition uh, against arbitration of a particular uh, subject matter. So in the U.S., uh, as a group of scholars working with the American Law Institute have noted, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has used the term arbitrability loosely to encompass the entire range of grounds upon which an agreement might be denied enforcement. Thus, arbitrability uh, has been used to describe challenges, including uh, uh, the challenges that are shown on the slide. Uh, that uh, first, challenges based on legal, legal prohibitions, what I think uh, the uh, rest of the world, certainly most of the world, would refer to as objective arbitrability. Uh, challenges to contract formation, uh, challenges to contract enforceability, uh, challenges based on the scope of the arbitration provision, uh, challenges based on prerequisites uh, to arbitration and uh, procedural uh, uh, issues, a and lastly, challenges based on public policy. Uh, so this injects a fair amount of confusion uh, when a uh, non-U.S. lawyer uh, hears a, a U.S. Uh, a judge, lawyer, or arbitrator talk about arbitrability, and we'll explore this further uh, as we go. Um, uh, for now, uh, I want to introduce Alina, who's going to take the uh, next uh, piece of the program and tell us a little bit about um, the uh, different approaches to objective arbitrability. Uh, Alina was good enough to introduce Sabina and me. Um, let me introduce you to Alina. Uh, Alina Merominskaya is a partner at uh, Wagaman and Saya. Wagaman Isaya, I should say, Lawyers and Engineers, a Chilean uh, interdisciplinary boutique firm which is focused on construction and infrastructure disputes, dispute avoidance, and strategic contract and claim management. Alina is a Russian lawyer. Uh, her law degree is from Kaliningrad University. Uh, she also holds an LLM degree and a PhD degree from the University of Gertingen in Germany. She acts as arbitrator and as a member uh, to the Directive Board of Arbitration and Mediation Center of the Santiago Chamber of Commerce. She was distinguished by Who's Who Leader, sorry, Who's Who Legal as a global leader in construction uh, 2020 and in arbitration 2020. So with that, uh, uh, Alina, can you uh, take us around the world uh, with uh, arbitrability? Thank you very much, Shelby, for the kind presentation. Well, uh, in contrast to, to the USA, the civil law world has been strongly influenced by the 
central model law. Thus, the arbitrability notion is rather reserved for matters that can be subjected to arbitration and there are not subject to legal prohibition challenges, as you called it in your review. And as we can observe from this uh, slide, we will usually encounter a broad definition of what is arbitrable uh, with some specific carve outs. For example, under Spanish law, arbitrable are disputes on matters of free disposition according to law. This is this broad definition which can be found in the majority of legislation that uh, highlight some specific um, some specific issue rather the matters are of pecuniary uh, nature there are economic interests or as i said a free disposition according to law and if we compare the situation to the usa uh, situation uh, it's very different Contract formation challenges, for example, would be an issue of validity of an arbitration agreement. Unenforceability challenges would be exactly that, another issue of enforceability of the arbitration clause. Scope challenges would be an issue of arbitral tribunal jurisdiction. Procedural challenges would be an issue of admissibility or subject matter jurisdiction. And public policy issue would be part of an ex post review conducted after the award is issued. So it's, it's quite necessary to define what is the scope of the concept arbitrability when you are in a dialogue uh, among a US party and perhaps the rest of the world. And of course, legislators' decisions on arbitrability vary significantly. Just as an example, Corporate disputes are subject to mandatory arbitration under Chilean law. They are submitted to arbitration by virtue of law, which is clearly not the case in Russia. At the same time, all disputes arising from public procurement contracts are subject to mandatory arbitration in Peru while they are not arbitrable in Chile and apparently not in Russia. And there is also a dangerous trend from my point of view uh, is when you deduct the notion, the scope of arbitrability from public policy concept. So if, um, if a matter is a matter of public interest or public policy issue, then the matter is not arbitrable. For example, Bolivian law does, does it explicitly. And I would really like to hear from our Russian audience how it has been treated in Russia lately. And why is it so dangerous? Well, the public policy is an open concept and it creates an additional uncertainty as to when a matter can be subject to arbitration and when it cannot. Well, and as we can see uh, on the chart, um, in the United States, commercial matters are subject to arbitration or objectively arbitrable. And I would return the floor to Shelby for him to explain uh, what, is, what does it exactly mean. I can hear yep. you. Yep, <laughs> I'm, I'm back. <laughs> so so in, in the United States, the, uh, the principal U.S. statute that deals with arbitration is the Federal Arbitration Act. And it enforces, I quote, uh, any written provision uh, in any maritime transaction or a contract evidencing commerce to settle by arbitration, any controversy thereafter arising. And so dealing in, in, in that language with uh, pre-dispute arbitration agreements. Uh, it also covers and enforces uh, any quote, agreement in writing to submit to arbitration, an existing controversy that arises out of such a contract, a commercial contract. And the term commerce is interpreted very broadly 
uh, and there is a very strong national policy in favor of enforcing agreements to arbitrate. Uh, in the U.S., there is a presumption that an agreement to arbitrate is valid, and the policy in favor of enforcement extends to claims based on U.S. statutory rights. Uh, for example, civil antitrust claims are arbitrable, and employment discrimination claims are arbitrable. Uh, in the absence of a clear congressional intent to bar disputes from arbitration, uh, the courts will enforce arbitration provisions. There are a few limited carve-outs. Uh, automobile distributors uh, are uh, disputes re regarding uh, automobile distributorships uh, are to some extent carved out. Uh, there are some other carves out, carve-outs and a few regulatory regimes. And uh, creditor-debtor disputes uh, over which a bankruptcy court has assumed jurisdiction may not be arbitrable. Uh, but, um, but there is candidly not a lot that is not arbitrable. And therefore, there are not a lot of cases on legal prohibitions or objective arbitrability in the U.S. because there just aren't that many uh, such cases. Um, I think, uh, I, I believe I was to cover as well, uh, just uh, very quickly, a slide dealing with uh, some of the carve outs around the world. There we are. Uh, so you can see uh, the, the range uh, and how these carve outs tend to cluster. A number of countries do uh, prohibit arbitration in bankruptcy and insolvency matters. Uh, there are some restrictions in company law. Uh, competition and antitrust is not infrequently, we'll say, um, carved out. Uh, consumer protection and rights are uh, carved out, and probably more than, I've, than we've reflected on the slide here. Family marital relations are very commonly are, 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 are not arbitrable. And then uh, inheritance, IP disputes, landlord-tenant matters, uh, labor and employment uh, in many places, and then uh, matters involving real estate. Um, uh, so uh, that's a, that's a, a general uh, discussion of the U.S. and uh, objective arbitrability carve-outs. And I think, uh, Alina, I think we're back to you now uh, to open the floor for some discussion. Well, I, I like to hear from Sabina first because the contrast uh, between the Swiss law and the rest of the world might be of interest as well. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Sabina. <laughs> Thank you, Shelby and Alina. Yes, just to contrast uh, with what Shelby has been discussing, uh, I, I, Switzerland sits really at one end of the spectrum because I, when it comes to international arbitration, it has allowed any matter um, that has an economic interest to be arbitrable. And so this means that a lot of things that in other countries um, are not arbitrable, such as, as, as a, a contract, and the, well, contract disputes obviously fall, but um, corporate liability, uh, competition, um, corporate disputes, all of these uh, labor law, all of these disputes that in many other countries are not arbitrable are indeed arbitrable in Switzerland. And this is uh, a policy decision that, has, that the Swiss legislation has taken to make arbitration as wildly available as possible. It has its downsides, of course, including the fact that um, uh, some disputes might not be uh, enforceable, some awards might not be enforceable uh, in other jurisdictions, but this is the policy decision of the Swiss uh, legislator. There are only certain disputes that will fall out, some because they do not really entail an economic interest. Family disputes, for instance, are considered not to uh, fall within this uh, economic interest uh, provision. Or a certain carve-outs, such as the ones that uh, Shelby has mentioned, in particular criminal offenses, bankruptcy, uh, debt collection, and the like. But uh, moving now um, to, to Elena, I believe that what we really want to hear now is from the audience is what uh, is the situation in Russia? Yes, well, we are certainly aware that recent reforms in Russia have introdu introduced serious restrictions to the arbitrability of corporate disputes uh, or, or uh, have introduced additional requirements for them uh, to be able to be subjected to arbitration. For example, some categories of corporate dispute can be submitted to permanent arbitral institutions only. So we would really like to invite the audience to share with us the view 
uh, how this uh, additional restrictive conditions have been treated, uh, whether as an issue of arbitrability or other kind of notions and conditions, we would uh, like to hear uh, from uh, lawyers practicing in Russia uh, how this broad non-arbitrability of corporate disputes has impacted the practice and what are the other relevant sectors of matters that are non-arbitrable and what are the practical impacts thereof. So please, you are invited to intervene to enrich this overview and discussion. Do we have volunteers? Not enough coffee for the, at this coffee session. Okay. <laughs> well, that's the issue. No, that's what what um, what we've learned that there are certain restrictive conditions. Certain disputes cannot be subject. Corporate disputes cannot be subject to arbitration at all. And certain disputes have to have to comply with additional requirements. And as we we are expected to. Uh, come to a rather policy discussion at the end of our session. We wanted to um, engage the audience into discussion whether a broad or restricted concept of arbitrability have their advantages. But we can uh, we can return to this discussion to this question after we review what the actual topic of our coffee session is a uh, meaning who decides what matters are arbitrable and what matters are not and for that we we have um we have uh, questions for you <laughs> so sabina would you like to walk uh, our audience through the questions through the poll questions we've prepared Thank you, Alina. Yes, of course. So the, we have given a, a brief overview of what is arbitrability, how it's seen in different jurisdictions and what are the types of disputes that are commonly arbitrable. But the real question that we wanted to discuss today is who decides um, what is arbitrable and what is not. And we're speaking here of the concept of objective arbitrability. So what, who decides whether a dispute a category of dispute falls, uh, it is capable of being arbitrated. So here, Shelby circulated some questions to you last night, and um, I would like to invite you all now to participate with a poll that we're going to put now on the screen. And I believe that you should have the option on your screen to um, put them up there. We might have a technical issue. One second, please. Unfortunately, it looks like we have a technical question and the poll question, there's a technical problem. The poll questions that we had prepared are not available. So I, we will, I, since you received them all last night, um, I ho hope you've had a chance to uh, think about them. And in the meantime, I'm just going to say them out loud. I'm going to start with question number one. Who decides objective arbitrability challenges? The arbitrator, a judge, or it depends? And I don't know whether anyone in the audience wants to start with an answer um, on this question please feel free to speak. The whole point of the coffee session is to actually discuss um, the different scenarios, which might vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And Sabina, we're not, we're not restricting this by any means to Russia or to any other uh, not jurisdiction. At all. If anyone uh, wants not to at weigh all. in, that's fine. Um, I see that my friend Paul Mason is on the line and he, 
had written to me last night about uh, Brazil. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about uh, arbitrability in Brazil? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those in, in Moscow uh, and in Europe. Uh, it, my video, I can't enable a video. If the, if the host wants to enable it, it's okay. Otherwise, they can look at the mountains in front of my house in Brazil there, which is a, the photo. Um, a couple of things. Um, first, just before getting to Brazil and Latin America, the carve outs that Shelby mentioned, which, which was very interesting. Um, there's another one which some of us who worked in the corporate transactional world know, which is foreign distributor agreements, especially in a, the, the small Latin American countries. They, they want to protect their local distributors, so they require them to go to the local courts. Um, now, um, coming to arbitrability in Brazil, I'll try and be very brief. Um, Brazil takes the Spanish approach, which I think was on the slide that Elena showed, which is what Port Brazilians call direitos disponíveis in Portuguese, which means those rights which can be freely negotiated. And for a long time, that did not include public sector, which was, which was <laughs> important because the public sector in Brazil is a huge part of the economy. But in the two 2015, the law was amended to include the public sector. So they're in uh, now. The, um, the original arbitration law spelled out in the legislation, 1996, uh, the who decides this that was a great question that that sabrina brought up and in brazil the under the 1996 original arbitration law it was the courts and I, i'm not sure they gave a lot of thought to it i i, I well some of the people that, that drafted it are colleagues and friends of mine so i won't go too far but i don't think that was an issue a, a hot issue at the time and they didn't want opposition to the law from the judiciary so they they threw that bone but uh, it had some consequences coming fast forwarding to 2014 to 17 there were three huge icc cases arbitrations in brazil the first one 2014 involving a division of an oil block for various purposes into two or more oil blocks um the cases were all between the national brazilian regulatory body called anp and petrobras which is the company everybody is heard of now, uh, which is a government mature owned uh, oil enterprise, uh, full service oil company. So the first one, 2014, was stopped by the Rio, the federal court in Rio, which is Petrobras's headquarters and also ANP headquarters. Uh, and they stopped it on subject matter arbitrability grounds, and it was the court that did it. That, that arbitration was at the time the world's second largest arbitration only after Yukos. So that would have been a, a very large arbitration, significant one. Then in 2017, uh, there was another ICC arbitration between them, but this one, this one had a, was over different oil blocks and over a different subject matter, which had to do with collection of taxes. And there the court stepped in. This time it was the Superior Court of Justice, Brazil's highest court on oil arbitration matters. Um, they, they, they handle everything for arbitration uh, at the highest instance. And they decided since tax collection was somehow negotiable uh, in the context of which it was being uh, discussed, that the arbitrators, uh, uh, no, they didn't decide the arbitrators would do it. They decided that it was okay to arbitrate it, period. And then the third case was later on 2017, uh, which followed, and this is the end of the wrap-up, 2015, Brazil amended the arbitration law. And they made a lot of splashy amendments, uh, which were well advertised. But one which was not advertised was, for me, maybe the most important one they made, which is they quietly excised this Article 25 of the original law that gave the courts the, the power to make these decisions. And they gave it to the arbitral tribunal instead. So now competence, competence, with which this is inextricably tied, right? Um, took a big leap forward, in my opinion, with the amendment to law in 2015 and 2017. Another one of these oil block ICC cases came to the uh, Superior Court of Justice and they just said, no, we're not touching that. We're going to give it to the arbitral body to do it. And, and that's how we stand today. Thank you for your patience in all this. Paul, thank you very much. We um it, someone surely uh can give us a uh a, a, 
a resume of the situation in Russia, which would be uh, particularly welcome. Um, I think that uh, uh, Alina has, has set forth uh, uh, very succinctly our understanding, but uh, none of us are on the ground in Russia. And we do know that this is an area that's had some uh, development and flux in the last few years. Can someone help us with it? Okay, well, Sabina, I wonder if we should turn to the uh, question about the about when uh, challenges are, are made. Certainly, we have now tried to put up the poll. Let's see if this time it works. Let's just give us just one second on this end. I do believe, however, that um, for some reason we are not allowed to turn on your camera. So whoever wants to speak will only be doing so on audio. Um, sorry about that, but hopefully that makes you less shy. Yeah, I would, I would actually welcome that. And I think all the participants would welcome my <laughs> being restricted, to, restricted to audio. <laughs> oh, let's try the poll now. Let's see if it works. It looks like it, it did. So, oh, now we have two polls together. Well, feel free to answer both of them if you want. Uh, Sabina, I'm not seeing it. Oh, Our okay. Others... So launch polling. There, we, there we are. There we are. Yeah. Technology. We have all have to learn here on our feet, right? With this pandemic. This yep. has been uh, good for all of us <laughs> in the arbitration world. So I hope that you all are um, generous with us with our technical glitches. Do we have only one answer? Is that it? I see one of one. Uh, no. I see it. We have a we have a, a chat that oh. says that the that the panelists are not allowed to vote. The panelists are not allowed to vote. Or the uh, or the uh, uh, the. And as we promoted people, everyone people. to panelists, nobody. We, we did, people. didn't we? Yeah. We have promoted everyone to panelists. Oh, that's why. Okay. <laughs> I see what the problem is. Since we promoted everyone to panelists, then nobody's allowed to vote. Great. Uh, anyway. <laughs> you can demote, you can demote us all. Okay. But that means that everybody can speak. So even if you originally registered as a, an inactive participant, you now have the right to talk. Uh, so please exercise that right. And we would love to hear from you. Who, uh, when do you think that these challenges can be brought? Earlier is better, I think, just commonsensically. Yep. Because otherwise you, you could be charged with waiving your right later, depending on what you're bringing up. Well, but, but, wait, but where, Paul, are you, are we talking about arbitral, arbitrability trial challenges to arbitrators or arbitrability challenges to judges? Uh, because yes, you could, you could face a waiver claim, that's right. Um, yeah, I think you got to, it, maybe it would be, depending on what regime you have, if, it, if, if the regime is right. for arbitrator, the panel to decide on that, you, uh, it makes sense to do it when they're formed and not too, uh, not, not too much before. Right. Uh, if not, you can go to the judge. Um, yeah. Well, so. skipping around a little bit, uh, forgive me, uh, co-moderators, but maybe I'll lay out to what I understand to be the situation about when uh, in the U.S. And uh, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, people are not allowed to vote. Uh, we, um, I'm seeing, I'm getting messages, we're getting messages saying that the voting just doesn't work. So uh, uh, that's a, uh, that's a pity. Um, but, uh, but again, as Sabina says, it doesn't uh, forbid uh, or prohibit uh, talking. Uh, here in, in the U.S., um, the typically uh, the if a matter comes before the court 
with respect to an arbitration. Uh, it will come before the court either because one side or the other has filed litigation, notwithstanding that there's an arbitration provision, or it will come to the court because um, uh, one, uh, and, and so there, there's, a, there's, an arb there's a litigation filed and the counterparty comes in and files a motion to dismiss the litigation and or stay, uh, or I should say, or, or stay uh, the, arbit the uh, litigation pending arbitration. But the other way it comes up is that uh, a, a party refuses to arbitrate and the counterparty can then go into court and ask the court to compel arbitration. And, and U.S. courts have been pretty um, uh, stingy about what they will allow in terms of uh, responses at that stage. A Supreme Court case in 2019 uh, said that the, uh, the bases uh, for opposing an, an application uh, to arbitrate are very narrow indeed. And in, in fact, um, the, the challenge in that case was uh, to the effect that the uh, arbitration claim was, quote, wholly groundless. And the Supreme Court said that doesn't matter. If there is an agreement to arbitrate and the court finds that there is an agreement to arbitrate, well, then the case goes to arbitration. Um, and generally speaking, uh, your challenges and the like are going to come up post-award. Now, this kind of begs the question of whether there's competence, competence in the in the U.S. And that's a uh, uh, that that's a somewhat difficult and, and fraught and I think uh, uh, situation. And, and and again, I think the situation is different uh, from what you see in the uh, in the rest of the world. Um, and, and, it, and it comes down in a, it, to what the standard of review is going to be uh, for a court at the conclusion of the arbitration. Will it be one in which the court will defer to the decision of the arbitrators, or will it be one in which the court is free to have a, uh, to take a fresh look at the decision uh, or the jurisdictional and, uh, and scope uh, uh, rulings by the arbitrators? Um, the, the, way the courts have sorted that out is to say uh, that if the parties have clearly and unmistakably delegated the right to make decisions on jurisdiction and admissibility to the arbitrators, uh, then the judge defers to the arbitrator's decisions regarding jurisdiction and admissibility. And if there's not a clear and unmistakable delegation, the judge will review the decision de novo uh, independently. And so this is a bit of a wrinkle uh, in the concept of competence, competence as I understand it. And, and I'll, I'll have to, I have to say that some US commentators, some academics insist that US arbitrators do automatically have the power of competence, competence. And certainly US arbitrators can and do make decisions regarding jurisdiction, scope, admissibility, and so forth. But again, these decisions are subject to review without deference or, or without a presumption of correctness. Uh, unless there is that clear and unmistakable delegation of the right to make them. So the result of all of this, and, 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 and I'll, I'll go ahead and say that most cases in the U.S., uh, uh, usually arbitrations in the U.S. Are, uh, are arbitrations in which the arbitrators do have competence, competence, because either uh, the uh, agreement of the parties um, has explicitly, clearly, and unmistakably delegated the right of competence, competence, or because the agreement adopts rules and the rules, institutional rules, ICC, AAA, ICDR, uh, and others, those rules typically provide for competence, competence. Uh, and so the courts have said, look, that's, that's sufficient. That's a sufficiently clear and unmistakable delegation of the uh, of the the right to to or the the uh, uh, the, the ability uh, for the arbitrators to determine their own jurisdiction, it is a delegation of competence. Competence. Um, so that's that is the the situation. But the result of all this, coming back to the question of when, uh, is that um, very typically uh, cases uh, go to the court. Uh, the court decides that there is an, inf uh, a, a, an arbitration agreement. Uh, the court sends the case to arbitration, and then the court uh, is, is available to take another look post-award. Um, and so that's, that's what we see in the U.S. Um, so maybe, I don't, I don't know whether uh, co-moderators, you want to comment on 
the situation in other jurisdictions uh, as it relates to the when issue. Uh, but um, uh, that's uh, 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 perhaps uh, what we should do unless we have someone who can weigh in from the audience. Well, under the UNCTRAL uh, model law legislations, all, all the sophisticated distinctions <laughs> are, are not necessary, actually, right? Because you have uh, the competence, competence principle uh, explicitly recognized under Article 16. Yep. And the third paragraph of this article allows you to go to the court uh, to challenge arbitrator's yep. decision uh, confirming its competence. So basically the issue of arbitrability from a systemic point of view should be included uh, as an objection to arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction and can be quickly reviewed by court. There is no need to wait until the final award is issued unless the arbitral tribunal deems it impossible to answer the question uh, before the, um, the issue is solved, uh, the matter in dispute is finally solved. Well, uh, unfortunately, Article 8 of the UNCTRAL model law is not explicit in this sense. You know? It does not say that uh, the arbitrability question should be submitted to the arbitral tribunal, right? Because it allows you to question uh, the, uh, to question the arbitration agreement based on its validity, lack of validity, unenforceability, or uh, inefficiency or impossibility to enforce, right? But in strict um, uh, terms and concepts of the UNCTRAL model law, it does not include the arbitrability of the dispute because the court is not aware of the dispute, the dispute will be submitted to the arbitral tribunal. Luckily, some jurisdictions like France, for example, uh, allows, uh, re restricts the review by ordinary court under Article 8, right, of the UNCTRAL model law. And also, if you compare the wording of the articles, of the second article of the New York Convention that does mention arbitrability, the UNCTRAL model law, Article 8, does not mention arbitrability. So uh, the later and more progressive, let's call it that way, law, uh, it should prevail always when um, this, the court in charge of the decision is a UNCTRAL model law jurisdiction court. And so but how does it work in practice? Do you feel like it works well? Uh, um, well, sometimes you might get like parallel proceedings uh, going. Uh, the, under Article 8, you might spend like about a couple of years <laughs> uh, discussing whether the arbitral agreement was unenforceable, for example. And in parallel, the arbitral, arbitral tribunal will confirm its jurisdiction and it can be quickly reviewed uh, before ordinary court. We have, we have a hand raise here. I, I... Yep. Uh, it wasn't okay. me, but meanwhile, if the person hasn't identified themselves, I could just make say a word about Brazil again. Brazil doesn't have the UNCTRA trial law. They did adopt the New York Convention, but they use their own domestic arbitration law more as a basis to enforce foreign awards. But coming to the question of when, Brazil is, is lots of parallel proceeding phenomena. So, you know, the typical thing is if the, the arbitration is significant in size, the respondent will go to court and try and stop it. And that's when it starts there. And then they'll raise various whatever jurisdictional objections they can. This just flows out of arbitrability a little bit into jurisdiction, but okay, same idea. And then, then Brazil has this legal animal called conflito de competencia, which means conflict of, of legal competence to rule on something between, and this sometimes is between two courts, the specialized court or general court, or this time it's between the arbitral tribunal and the court. And a lot of the cases, they go there, make, sometimes, as I said earlier, the, now the, the courts will defer to the tribunal if, if, if it falls into the disposable rights category. But other categories, uh, 
you know, that that's uh, sometimes courts do step in. For some courts tend to be interventionist in general. I authorized the person raising the hand to speak. I don't know whether it worked. We still have a lot to learn on how to manage Zoom. <laughs> if that, if 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 you're on mute and you're trying to speak, um, that's something that I I try to I, I commonly forget to unmute myself. Um, Paul, let me ask you a, a, a quick question: um, Is it? Uh, is it, is it right that um, if you don't have a uh, clear uh, indication of competence, competence uh, in a in a case that's covered by the uh, uh, by the Panama Convention, uh, then I think you go to a set of rules, the uh, Intercontinental. Um, oh, you, you, someone will know, but there is another set of rules that's promulgated, uh, yes. and and yes. and there is there is a clear. A delegation of competence, competence in those rules. Am I am I remembering that correctly? Um, your memory. I, I will admit that your memory on the Panama Con Convention must be better than mine because I haven't referred to it in a long time. But the, no one, it, no one does, unfortunately. I think it's yeah, I think there, it's there sort of an updated version of the New York Convention. But yeah, yeah, there, that's right, Shelby. There is an institution called Yak Yak, which is the interim. Uh, yeah. Commercial Arbitration Commission, which used to be based at the OAS in Washington. But moved to the Bogota Chamber of Commerce many years ago, and it's run there. And they are affiliated with the AAA uh, in a semi-formal way, or they were. And and so the, the I'm not sure if their rules have the competence. Competence. I hope so. The AAA ones do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So okay. I don't know if that helps, but yeah. Thanks. Sure. I'm afraid we're getting to the end of the session and we have been threatened with being cut off. So if we are cut off, I, I suggest we just keep speaking, but if we are cut off, uh, it's not because we, uh, we did it on purpose. <laughs> um, I, we, just to close the session, we, we wanted to raise the question with the audience as to what are the advantages or disadvantages of having an arbitrator or a judge decide. Uh, questions of arbitrability. I don't know if anybody has any views on this point. What do you think, Sabina? Well, um, I, I, I am a firm believer in the principle of competence, competence. So I do believe that uh, the arbitrators should have the right to decide at least at, at the very beginning. I think it's more efficient than to go and ask for court intervention. Um, and and, and it, it does, there's always a risk of court intervention being slightly protectionist. Um, however, the, it, it, it is also true that decisions on arbitrability by judges might, um, that are come fast in the day, for instance, if you I uh, have just started an arbitration and there's a dispute as to whether the, the decision is arbitrable or not, it might give a certain finality. Um, so, uh, and on the other hand, if, if, if a very liberal approach of, of competence, competence, or a, a li very liberal approach of what is arbitrability might create the risk that uh, an award might be um, valid at the place in which it was issued, but not valid at a place of enforcement. Um, so, I think that there's benefits to both, and I think that the right view would be to give arbitrators uh, the, the freedom to determine their competence, but subject, of course, to court review when it comes to arbitrability. I think in that sense, the New York Convention gets it right. I don't know if, Elena, you have any final comments? No, I fully support your view and uh, also just to add, I, I, I think not only the New York Convention gets it right, but the Unicentral model law gets it even better because it introduces this possibility of inter intermediate uh, review. So I, I undersign your firm position in favor of competence, competence. Yes, and I, I, I too subscribe. I think you're, uh, you're, you're right. and. Um, I, uh, you know, the uh, in the United States, our uh, the Federal Arbitration Act was enacted in in 1925, 
I think there's pretty widespread agreement that it uh, needs to be modernized. I think there's some concern about trying to get something through Congress. Uh, but I'll note that we are surrounded by unsatural model law uh, jurisdictions. Mexico is a model law jurisdiction. Uh, Canada and the uh, Canadian provinces are model law jurisdictions. A number of U.S. states are model law jurisdictions. So we, we need to move that way. Um, I, I, will, uh, I will say only one more thing, and that is thank you to the uh, participants for uh, sticking with us. And um, uh, we've, I've enjoyed uh, this discussion uh, and, and working uh, with uh, Sabina and Alina. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And uh, please feel free to send us any comments or questions by email um, if, if uh, as something comes up now that we're about to close. Thank you very much. Greetings to all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.